In terms of human exploration, I think as a species, humans have always pushed the boundaries. They've always explored, they've always wanted to understand the world, the universe around them. When you think about the higher education system that most of the world uses today, it was developed for an industrial age economy. So standardization, the idea that you would come in at age 17, everyone sort of came out of high school into college and you went off into your career, often with the same employer for the rest of your working life. That doesn't describe anyone's reality today. Um, you know, education had been, it was designed out of the industrial age, factories and we created programs that make cookie cutter people to go into the factories and be cogs in wonderful machines that made terrific advances. Now some of that work is gonna be done by bots. As a matter of fact, up to 45% of jobs will disappear. Okay, well, what will people do then? We have to think about building a higher education system for this much more fluid economy in which we live, where uh, work is changing all the time. Even if you don't change your job, your job will change out from under you, so you're constantly relearning. So STEM learning is really essential for all students to learn. It really is about computing, computer science, and engineering. That's really what it's about. And one of the things is that all the jobs of the future are going to require skills in these aspects. And so maybe you want to be a lawyer. Well, guess what? You'll need to learn how to program to pull down the cases and actually do some analytics. So the world is changing, and so our students, and the next generation will have to be comfortable, they will have to be native in the language of STEM. Well, fortunately, our technology moves a bit faster than our education. So it's a good example, people in computer science, it's quite often companies, they just try to get a freshman and just put them to study at the company rather than spending time at the university because Technologies these days really moving at the, the extreme pace. So what education give you is good fundamental knowledge. Because STEM, math and science, is really the tool of problem solving, it's computational thinking, it's the way to provide a kid the ability to think of, about how to solve the problems of the world. I always say I can get a four-year-old to code which is awesome and amazing. And you have kids who are barely, they're early readers that are interacting with robots and coding them up with block-based language because the kids are so open and receptive when you give them the tools to really learn. I mean, the, the future of education is indelibly tied to the future of work and what we've been talking about for some time and now actually seeing really happen is people who change what they do constantly and have a constant need for learning. We also know that industry is demanding something different from us. They don't trust a college degree as a signal of capacity in the way they once did. Fundamental knowledge in mathematics, in, in physics, in, in some other areas as well, it helps you to choose the area what, in which you are most excited about and really try to help you to find your way. Who are you? How are you designed? What, what inspires you? What do you care about? What do you want to spend your life on? What are your talents? You need the elements and you need to know how to integrate. You need to know how to create fusion. And that's the core concept, as a matter of fact, of fusion. In nuclear fusion, two nuclei come together, form a new one, and release a great deal of energy into the world. But likewise, in business, science and technology, and the arts and humanities, two ideas, two technologies, two whatevers, two industries, can come together, form something new, and release a great deal of value into the world. So I think when it comes to the spark for the big questions, um, those questions are the ones that bring in the brightest minds into science and technology. So in my personal experience, it's the big questions about the universe, the nature of space-time, are there multiverses? How do we combine the fundamental laws of quantum mechanics that govern material on the tiniest scales that we know in nature with the largest scales that are governed by gravity? We don't actually know how to combine the laws of physics yet. There's probably yet some undiscovered 
grand unified theory of physics that will describe all of those scales together. I think the mathematics that we need to discover, we need to use or invent to actually write down the equations that will help us solve that, those big questions and those big sparks are the things that come first. After that, one then may start to look and say, well, having developed all of the skills that one might as a student or a pupil or as a, as, as a researcher, you can then start to see where those can be applied. I think today, more than ever, it's really important for scientists to communicate their research findings. I uh, have been very fortunate in being able to do science communication, which is a little different from science education. I emphasize the many different ways that um, scientists can communicate with the public and contribute to uh, education. Um, you know, some people are shy. They, they don't like to be on TV, they don't like to give public talks, um, but they can do other things. They can edit textbooks, uh, they can build websites that uh, uh, are educational. Uh, th th there are a lot of other roles that, depending on your personality as a scientist, and your expertise you can fulfill. So I think popular culture is a really exciting opportunity to connect our young people with science. And I think that, you know, movies actually now, the, the sorts of graphics, the computer graphics that are required to produce the effects that one needs to be convincing in, in blockbuster movies. There's a lot of physics, there's lots of maths, there's lots of com high performance computing actually that goes into these movies. And so I think in terms of inspiring young people to go into that industry before we even talk about whether that will inspire them to think about um, big physics or big science or big space science projects, that alone is already exciting. Getting people excited about space um, can be very easy, it can be very hard. It, it really depends on the person and the background. I was this little girl growing up in Brazil and uh, following the Apollo program, all the, the launches and the race to the moon, and I really wanted to be an astronaut. Uh, pretty early on, I realized that I was female. Uh, there had only been one female astronaut at that time. Uh, I, I was Brazilian, Brazil had no space program, and I had terrible eyesight. So I realized becoming an astronaut is probably not going to work out, but I could become a scientist and work for NASA and work for the space program. And that's the trajectory I went on and, uh, and I succeeded. And the Apollo program was that trigger. And it was really important in my life. My background is from a small town in, in Uros. I, then I started in Moscow. I was trying to get my PhD in, in Holland, I worked in, in the UK, I worked in Singapore. And one thing which I learned, which would lead you to a success either in science or in business or in fact in any other area, is to be excited about what you're doing. If you do it simply because you think it is, it would be good, your parents will be happy, that's not what, what will get you to to success. The only condition, very, very necessary condition, is to be excited with, with what you're doing. I think in much of the world today, we are facing a crisis, a crisis of inequity, but it happens in the context of globalization, the impacts of technology, and a sense that there will be winners and losers. And if we leave people behind, we create enormous social unrest, fear, and anger. And I would argue that in my own country, in the United States today, a lot of what's happening right now are for people who feel like they've been left behind. I can put it in more positive terms as well, which is that there's enormous talent in all of our population. Poor kids are not dumber than smart kids. What they've had typically is a less good education. And what we can't do is squander the talent. The problems we face are too profound, whether it's climate change, our new economic models, our understanding the impact of technology. All of these things are hard. We can't leave the smart kids behind. So, so it's incumbent on us for the good of our societies, but also to take advantage of every smart problem solver that sits there at age five today in a poor neighborhood, in a poor school, to say, no, we can give you a path so you can be part of the solution. 
So there may be a very big question that we want to solve, and it may be 100, 150, 200 years before we get the answer to that. But the journey that we take along that path to answer those questions um, is really what then gives us the societal benefit. So one good example is Einstein's general theory of relativity, which when he first published his seminal paper back in 1915 um, was a great piece of mathematics, wonderful innovative thinking, but one you know could be excused for thinking it was an esoteric piece of theoretical physics that would lie in the literature. Um, now, a hundred years later, um, all of our global um, satellite positioning systems, our satellite navigation, our telecommunications um, could not operate in the way that they do without our understanding of general relativity and making sure that the maths sits in, a, in, our, in our satellites. And so Einstein did not sit down to invent satellite navigation, but without his discoveries we wouldn't have those, those benefits now.